You are listening to Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board. So what does it take for a woman to succeed in a male-dominated world? Hello, my name is Robin Erickson, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Off the Shelf, a book discussion series brought to you by The Conference Board. Today, I'll be sitting down with Shannon Huffman Paulson to discuss her latest book, The Grit Factor, Courage, Resilience, and Leadership in the Most Male-Dominated Organization in the World. I'm thrilled to be here with Shannon Paulson, who was the youngest woman to climb Denali, the highest mountain in North America. She also summited Mount Rainier and Mount Kilimanjaro. Those facts alone are impressive and took real grit and perseverance. But then Shannon became one of the first female attack helicopter pilots, eventually leading an Apache flight platoon on deployment to Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was in the military where she learned the lessons of leadership and what it took to succeed as a woman in a male-dominated world. Welcome, Shannon. I'm so glad to have you on the show today and to have this opportunity to chat with you. My first question for you is, how did you decide to follow a path in the U.S. Army after receiving your bachelor's degree in literature? The fact that you had a liberal arts background before joining the military was surprising to me. That's a great question. I was a ROTC cadet at Duke University, and when I first arrived at Duke University, I thought that I would look at ROTC, but that it wasn't likely a good fit. I'd never envisioned myself in the Army, and yet I knew that it was also really difficult to pay for college. So I stopped by each of the recruiting booths at a college campus fair and talked to the Air Force and the Navy, but they wanted me to be an engineer, and I knew that I wanted to study liberal arts. And the Army said I could study liberal arts, and so I thought I would give it a try. And it ended up that it was a great fit. I connected to this concept of service and serving something larger than myself uh, while still studying the liberal arts, which I think is actually quite relevant to it. And I also really enjoyed the people that I was serving with. So it was a combination of, of those two things that ended up making it an excellent fit. So then here's the follow up to that. With so many career paths in the U.S. Army, what made you want to or choose to become a helicopter pilot, especially with your background? (laughs) Well, I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, and Alaska has the highest percentage uh, per capita anyway of private aviation. So I'd been exposed to aviation quite a bit. I'd always liked adventure. I had by that point earned my advanced parachutist license. I had uh, climbed an alley. I had really enjoyed the opportunity to find and enjoy adventure and challenge and, and pushing myself as hard as I could. So I figured that if I had time to serve and the opportunity to serve, that I wanted to do that service doing the coolest thing that I could. And that looked like flying to me. So that's really a cool answer. Cool. Very cool. So the focus of your latest book is The Grit Factor. How do you define grit and why did you decide to write about it? Yeah, well, most people that are listening probably know that Angela Duckworth, who's the researcher at University of Pennsylvania, has defined grit as passion and perseverance towards a very long-term goal. I've really thought of grit as a dogged determination in the face of difficult circumstance. And that's something that I had been thinking about and I had talked about with my family growing up for sure. But when I entered the military and I had the opportunity not just to fly, but to be one of the first women to fly the Apache. I was in this early integration of women into attack aviation. And it was really one of the first times that I had come into an environment where I wasn't welcome and where some people actively resisted my being there in pretty emphatic ways. And so I have always thought that grit was critical to getting through those times. And as I started to do the work reaching out to other women, also leaders in the vanguard of their fields across the military, across the services, across the generations, really. Grit really comes out as something that was critical in all of their successes. So then I suspect many of our listeners are wondering, is your book relevant for men too? My gosh, so much so. I I didn't intend to write it for, and I didn't write it for women at all. The leaders happen to be women, which means that they often faced what I like to think of as a double crucible, right? They faced the challenges of the work, which by itself in the military for anybody is extremely challenging. And then they often faced dealing with an environment that was not supportive of their being there. So they had this double crucible, which required grit in in the extreme. And so what I hope is that these stories and the lessons learned and the tactical exercises that are provided as well are accessible to everybody, no matter where you are, what industry you are working in, what level you're working at. And I have a chance to talk to companies and industries across the country, around the world, 
And 201, I hear feedback from both men and women about how critical this is in their lives. And so I'm so grateful for that because it's certainly intended. It's intended for everybody. Very cool. Well, I'm sure that that will help them as they're listening to think that, yes, this is relevant for them, especially for the men who are listening. And I'm glad that it's relevant. So my next question for you is, is grit something that you're born with or can it be developed? I'm sure you know there's all these questions around leadership skills and all of that. So what do you think? Yeah, for sure. And I get this question so often because I think I think in part because people either feel like they don't have it or they've lost it or maybe they hope they don't see it in someone they're working with or a family member where they really want to be able to help them. And the reality is the science is pretty darn clear that grit is not something, and, and from my own experience, grit is not something that is only for you know big mountain climbers and military pilots. Grit is something that is innate to every single one of us. And it's absolutely scientifically supported that we can develop grit. We can develop resilience. There's absolutely no question that there's a number of different exercises that we can do, a number of different practices that we can do that help to develop that. And in the grit factor and at the grit Institute where I have training that supports the grit factor, I really think of not as this discrete thing that you take off the shelf when you need it and then put it back away and try to build it up when you can, but it's really part of the whole leader. It's really integrated into the fabric of who we are. And so that is something that is, it is uh, innate to every single one of us. Well, very cool. Well, that that's very useful. And I think uh, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, very important right now, the idea of resilience before we get there. In the book, you describe eight aspects of grit. Tell us about them and do they need to be developed in order? And if not, where should we start? (laughs) That's such a good question. You know, when I started to go through the research that I had been doing over several years of interviewing these leaders in the vanguard of their fields and going through, combing through each of those interviews to say, what are the primary takeaways? What are the lessons? What are the stories? How can I synthesize those and make them available to a broader audience? they really broke out into three phases. And that's how the grit factor breaks out as well. And those three phases are commit, learn, and launch. Now I like to think of those really as correlating to what I now call the grit triad. And that grit triad is a connection to our past, a full engagement in the present, and a future looking perspective that remains grounded in both past and present. So it's really part of this grit triad. And that's how these stories and lessons learned and the research that supports them really ended up breaking out. So under commit, there's two different aspects of grit. The first piece is, and this is again, backwards looking, right? Looking at our past, looking at our lives and owning our stories, understanding that we don't get to choose the raw material of our lives, but we absolutely have the opportunity and the responsibility to shape that material into a life that's worth living. And that's how something that we each have to define for ourselves. The second part of commit, the second aspect of grit is drilling down to core purpose. I like to say that it's fine to start with why, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. So we're going beyond why. We're going deep into what matters most for us as a leader. And this is this is deep internal work. I think the, the very common error is to, especially as a young leader, but to jump into a new organization and say, okay, I'm connected to this mission. I'm connected to this vision without first having done that internal work. And a leader knows that he or she has to start with the most important story. And the most important story is his or her own story and his or her own core purpose. The second part then is learn. And under learn, we talk about three different aspects. The first is building your team. And I like to call it drawing your circle, really because there's multiple aspects to this. One is that you've got to be part of other people's circles, supporting them in their work, which is good for your work also. You need to know the different roles that are really helpful for success. Many of these leaders didn't benefit from that, but all of them wish that they'd had it. And then also understanding that those who don't support your success can't be part of that circle, which is a very hard lesson a lot of young leaders have to learn. The second part is really understanding that once you've drawn that circle, once you've built that team, relationships are key to your success throughout your life. And so we look at one particular skill that relates to that team, and that is active listening. Because 201, the senior leaders, the general officers that I spoke with across the services indicated active listening as one of the most strategic and underappreciated leadership skills. So we'll talk about the art and the science of active listening. 
And then finally, we're looking at building our resilience, building our grit, taking a few tactical exercises, all born from the Army's Master Resilience Training Program, again, born from the University of Pennsylvania's Positive Psychology Program. But we look at a few discrete exercises that seem to be small, but are very, very powerful in shaping our mindset. Finally, we get to launch. That's the last three pieces. And in launch, I talk about audacity, I talk about authenticity, and I talk about adaptability. This is starting to get a bit more strategic because now we're grounded in the past, we're firmly engaged in the present, and we're looking towards the future. And we've got to be able to be audacious when we do that, be willing to take risks, be willing to fail, understand, like as Churchill said, that failure is not final. And as I like to say, it's not failure that matters, it's what you do with it that counts because failure is part of the path to success. You have to be willing to take risks. The second part of that is authenticity. Authenticity comes out again and again as absolutely critical in that you've got to be able to be yourself. And it's so tempting for so many leaders, especially if they're a minority in a majority field, to try to take on the mantle of that culture so much that it violates their core values and who they are. And that simply is not a sustainable way to lead, nor does it allow you to bring all of the many gifts that you have to the position of leadership. So being authentic is critical. And then finally, being adaptable. And wow, I mean, in these times today, we all know about being adaptable. And that means not being too wed to any one course of action, not being too wed to success following a particular checklist, but being willing to adapt when circumstances change. So those are the eight factors that really came out of these conversations and from the research that supported it. Wow. Thank you so much for that summary, Shannon. I think our listeners will find that really useful. Um, The first aspect of grit that you just spoke about was to know your story. And I'm a big reader and a movie buff. I love epic stories like those in Star Wars. But why is knowing our stories so important to developing grit? I love that question because that is the place that we all need to start. And that was the second part of your, your previous question that I didn't answer. But that is where we need to start. And it's so important because really being able to own our own story, going back over the arc of our lives and saying, these are the circumstances that happened. Here's the places I was successful. Here's the places that I failed and I learned something. Here's a place I developed a strength or here's a place that I realized I didn't really wanna go in this direction. You can start to suss out your core values. That's the first step before you start to drill down to that core purpose, that heart purpose. And that becomes the foundation. That's the foundation to which you can tether yourself. That's the foundation that you can always hold on to, no matter what the turbulence is that you might be facing. As long as you're staying true to your core values and the decisions that you make, those decisions might change over time as circumstances change. But you're always staying true to your story. You're staying true to your core purpose. So again, that's really the foundation of the self. And the foundation of the self is what is really the thing that allows us to navigate through challenging times and and employ that grit that we all both have and we need to develop and that we need to put into play. Wow. That's a really good reminder to spend some time in that meditation. And I love the connection that you made between the fact that we, we have to commit and that it's important to know our stories in order to do that. You also talked about the next chapter, which was to drill down to your core purpose. And in that chapter, you wrote one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is why I knew that I would really love having this conversation with you in part. But uh, the quote was by author and theologian Frederick Beekner. And Beekner said that you find vocation in the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. So what does that mean to you? And why is the concept of vocation important? And how can we find it? So it's a, it's a big, big question, right? It's a really hard question. And that's also one of my favorite quotes as well. Um, and it certainly goes to the importance of understanding your own story, understanding your values, understanding and doing the work to drill down to your core purpose, because that's where you start to understand, hey, where are the places that bring me joy? Where are the places that I'm best able to contribute? And for young people, I often ask, hey, And this is not my idea, by the way. I'm borrowing this from somebody, but unfortunately, I don't know who I'm borrowing it from. So I hope they'll let me know someday. But what in the world breaks your heart? You know, what what is the challenge that breaks your heart? And how do you want to be a part of that? And how do you want to give back? And so part of that has been the work that I've done as well. My path has been pretty windy. I went from the military. I earned my MBA at the tech school. I spent some time in the corporate world as well, in the medical device and the technology industries. 
And then I left and came back to my original love, which was doing some more creative work, but still very, very uh, intimately connected with leadership. So finding a way to blend creativity and leadership in a way that was really relevant. And where I see all of this coming together is that by knowing my own story actually connects to the concept of story in the sense that it became so evident to me that some of the places that I had not been able to connect to earlier some of the things that I hadn't been wise enough as a young leader to know was that I really did, I was going to be able to contribute best if I was true to my story and true to my core values. And so the opportunity right now to come back to this concept of story, to be able to use narrative, to be able to relay really critical life lessons for people is just an honor. I mean, it truly is an honor. And I would say in the grit factor, it's not, of course, just my own story. It's many people's stories who have so generously shared those stories and lessons learned. So I've come back to it realizing that I had left this aspect of creativity, which was a core value of mine, out completely of my professional life. And it's not that there's nothing professional about management, because there certainly is. But um, but I would say that I hadn't been able to include that enough in the work that I was doing. And so now that I can blend that experience and that love of leadership and that passion for creativity and story to be able to deliver really life-changing opportunities to people. It's it's just, it's an incredible joy and it's an honor. So that's what that means to me. Shannon, that's a great definition of uh, vocation and why it's so important. And I uh, grew up with a father who loved his job so much that he was willing to do it for free. And uh, also, you know, thought, oh man, what is it, that one thing that I love to do and uh, feel very grateful that seven years ago, I actually found this role um, that I have as a research analyst and uh, feel like I finally found my vocation. And so that's another story for another time, no. but uh, love, love your definition and that uh, you use that quote. And uh, I, I felt like I'd found a kindred spirit in you when I was reading the book. So, so thank you for that. Absolutely. And I do think it's important to know for young leaders that you don't have to find this right away. I used to be so envious of that, like the people that seemed like they knew their passion right out of the gate, right, since they were 12 years old. And and the reality is I had, I had inklings, I had hints, but I didn't really know what it was. And I think in some regards, we're constantly taking that raw material and shaping it. So that's okay. Just let yourself be fully engaged in the present where you are right now and be aware of that past and that future. So those things continue to evolve as our lives and our careers do as well. I totally agree because almost no one these days has just one career. So right. uh, most of us are moving around, jumping from career to career. So if, you, if you're not, if you haven't found your vocation yet, I think it's a great dream and great purpose, a great goal to have. So we're going to take a short break for some quick announcements and be back in just a minute to continue this really fascinating conversation with Shannon Paulson on her book, The Grit Factor. And we're going to talk about why it's particularly relevant during COVID-19 and the times we're in right now. Can you, your team, or your company benefit from insights such as the ones provided in this podcast? They are immediately available when you join the Conference Board, a membership-based think tank that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead. Reaching across industries and geographies, we bring together our noted experts, senior executives from the world's largest companies, and nonpartisan practical research to help you address your most important business issues. Our membership packages are tailored to your organization's unique needs and budget. To learn more about our offerings, go to www.conferenceboard.org and click join on the top bar to connect with one of our product specialists. Hello and welcome back to our conversation with Shannon Paulson about her book, The Grit Factor, which I think is particularly compelling right now during the COVID-19 crisis. We're living in the midst of multiple crises, a global pandemic, a financial crisis, racial unrest, and political unrest. It's a completely unprecedented time where we need resilience more than ever. And just to throw a little data at this, in fact, the Center for Disease Control in August of 2019 reported that 8% of Americans had a diagnosed anxiety disorder. And in 2020, it's up to 38%. So when you think about that, that's only the people who've been diagnosed. Think about the the rest of us or the the stress that's been there. And uh, so anxiety is definitely something that we're dealing with right now. So uh, Shannon, given this high level of anxiety we're all feeling, 
What do you think will resonate most with our listeners? And how can readers use your book to develop their own grit and resilience right now? Robin, that is such a good question. And I certainly could never have guessed that this book would come out at this time. I think it has always been a necessary book. And again, I say that because it's so many other people's stories and lessons learned as well, but it's could not be more timely with what all of us are facing right now. You know, one of the things that I think is so important, and I talk again to clients about this all the time, is this idea about this grit triad that we just discussed before the break. We talked about this groundedness in the present this understanding of the past and this forward looking understanding, right? So there's this triad of commit, learn, and launch. But surrounding that triad is a mindset. And mindset is something I used to not like the word because it's a little bit amorphous and it's a little bit vague. So we'll get into it a little bit more here, but a mindset specifically of grounded optimism. And I talk about the anecdote in the book that several of your listeners will probably know, which is that of Admiral Stockdale. And that is His story is told, among other places, in Jim Collins' uh, business classic, Good to Great. He was a prisoner of war at the Hanoi Hilton for seven and a half years. And because he was the ranking prisoner, he was horribly tortured. He was in solitary confinement for, I think, about half of his time. His legs were broken three times. And when he was finally released, they asked him, what's the difference between those who lived and those who died? And he said, oh, that's easy. The ones who died were the optimists. So how does that relate to this idea of the criticality of grounded optimism? The caveat that Stockdale would make that I think is so important for us all to take away for today is that you have to maintain a faith in the future, a faith that we're going to come out of this, and we are, with a grounded reality and understanding of what we're facing right now. And the examples that I try to think of that relate most specifically to this would be those people who back in March said, oh, we're going to have a vaccine by June or the summer is going to make things go away. Well, clearly, clearly that wasn't the case. None of the scientists thought that was the case. Really, nobody thought that was the case. But there's a few people that wanted to hold on to that and think, oh, it's all going to get back to normal in, you know, three or six months. And that's not a reality that is realistic. It's not grounded in the facts. And so to be optimistic, but grounded in the realities of today, there's a couple of different exercises that I think are really, really helpful. Because looking forward to say, oh, I'm looking forward to Thanksgiving dinner with four generations around the table is probably pretty unrealistic this year. So the two things that I recommend are to celebrate short-term successes. Maybe that's even weekly successes. Maybe it's simply that we recorded this podcast this week or you wrote a chapter in your book or you made the contact that you need to for a strategic partnership. Whatever that one thing is or those two things are, really celebrate those successes in the short term, the small things. And then look out to the long term, maybe three or four years from now and say, where Where has our family always wanted to go on vacation? Let's start to plan that, get excited about that, read about that. So you're starting to look forward to something far enough in the future that it's realistic because we really don't know what the next really 12 months are going to look like. And so look for something a little bit farther out. So that short term and the very long term, as opposed to the intermediate term where the horizon is really unclear, I think is helpful to both anchor ourselves and allow ourselves some points of celebration. The second part that I would say is really, really important, and this is not in the grit factor, so this is a freebie, but I think especially at this point, we're six months in, actually seven months in, a lot of people are tired, a lot of people are anxious, and I think it's also critical to step back, spend that time on your story, and do some self-care. I know that sounds a little bit, a little wishy-washy maybe, or a little a little pie in the sky. But at the end of the day, we all need to rest. We need to take care of ourselves with good nutrition and lots of hydration. We need to spend time with the people that we really love if we're lucky enough to be living in the same house with them. And if not, then via Zoom. And really holding on to those things that matter the most, taking care of ourselves and taking care of the people that are closest to us. So that kind of a grounding I think is really, really important as we face this challenge with this very, very uncertain horizon. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate you going into that much detail and for giving us the suggestions for the short term and the and the long term. I would just like to encourage the listeners that um, at the end of every chapter, uh, there is also an exercise. 
Um, so when uh, Shannon's talking about taking that time for self-care or uh, trying to learn these skills, that she's got some great examples. And I'm looking forward to going through more of them. So thank you again for that. Wonderful. Great. So I did want you to talk a little bit about the chapter, Draw Your Circle, because you say that all soldiers know it's the circle of community that pulls them through the very hardest time. And this is also connected to COVID because the communities for many of us have have, have become very absent, right? Or they're only present on camera. Um, but you put incredible importance on mentors, actually putting them at the center of the circle. So tell us why mentors are so significant and then give us an example or two of your mentors. Yeah, the relationships and the different relationships that are critical to all of our successes is a really important thing to recognize, I think. And it's not something that I thought about strategically Gosh, very many times, to be honest. Uh, but it is something that comes up again and again, especially for those people who sustained a 20 or 30 year long career. So, for example, the general officers that I interviewed and actually a couple of the different dissertations that I looked, on, looked at that looked at those general officers and what was key to their successes. There are a number of people, myself included, whose time in the military did not include a mentor. And I think I would have benefited tremendously from one. Um, I know that there are several of the leaders that I interviewed who said that they really wished that they had had one. And there are others who did benefit. And again, I think most people who made it all the way to general officer are people who had understood that that was a critical relationship and had found a way to develop it. I think the best example that I can give, because I, I wouldn't say that I have a, and I'm an example of one of these people that wishes <laughs> that she had a mentor. Um, and I think there are many people who have mentored me. So I want to, to give credit to that. For sure. But um, but the best example that I think is probably most informative for your listeners is to talk about the example that we really spent some time on in the grit factor, which was looking at Major General Don Dunlop of the Air Force and her mentorship relationship with Marsh Carter, who was her mentor that she met while she was a White House fellow. And what was so important about that and helpful, I think, for people to understand is that when she was a White House fellow, she was initially paired with another woman leader to be a mentor to her, but they didn't really click. And the reality was they were just paired because they were both women. And I think that is a, a common error in the sense that women and men are all quite different. And so if there's not some natural chemistry and a natural connection, then that's probably not the right relationship to explore. When she met Marsh Carter, she realized that they both had a love of flying and they both had this incredible leadership background and they clicked immediately. And so Marsh has continued to be her mentor for some time. And I had a chance to talk with both of them about that relationship. So I think that's a critical piece to take away from the idea of mentorship, which is that you want to find somebody that you click with because you learn from each other. You, It's not a one-way street. It's not somebody up on a pedestal broadcasting down to the person who's taking notes madly, right? It's a discussion. It's a conversation. It tends to be a bit more strategic. Uh, but I think that that example of ensuring that mentors and those relationships come about by virtue of commonalities and by a good chemistry of working together is a really important one to take away as people think about that in their own lives. So if we don't already have one, how do you suggest that we find a mentor? <laughs> Well, that's a good question. And I think that is a, it's a million dollar question as well. Part of that is, is continuing to, to talk to people and, and to learn from people and to look for those places where maybe somebody is a little bit more experienced than you are or a lot more experienced than you are in a field. See if you have that kind of connection or that chemistry. And, and it doesn't have to be intense, but it just does need to be something where you feel like you can learn from each other. And then approach that person and say, would you be willing to talk, you know, maybe once a month or so. I think once you've tried that relationship on for size for both people, again, because this is a two-way street, then you want to also establish some parameters around that. Like we're going to meet monthly or we're going to meet every six weeks for a, a Zoom right now, but a coffee later or a, or a drink. And we're going to talk about, you know, these different areas. So it, it, it has some some structure to it and some boundaries to it. And I think that is pretty key to, to a beneficial mentorship relationship. But it really is about looking around, looking around, seeing who has experience in your field, places where you might have some connections, and, and then approaching that person and saying, hey, I'd love to learn from you. Would you be willing to, to sit down and do this? I think that's great advice. And I'm sorry I'm asking hard questions, but uh, I would also add to your answer that, you know what, sometimes our needs change. And so sometimes the person who we needed to mentor us through one 
area um, of our career isn't the person we need for the next Absolutely. phase. So uh, sometimes relationships change just by nature of, of what's needed. So that's right. Yes, absolutely. So I want to ask you another question uh, specifically about a specific chapter um, called Have the Audacity to Be Yourself. You say that it wasn't easy for you to be yourself in a culture that may seem to demand something different. So how did you do it? And how can we find the courage to stay true to ourselves? Well, I like that question a lot because I will tell you that I wrote the chapter because it came out of many, many conversations, but also because it's an area that I failed in in my 20s and while I was serving in the military. When I arrived at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, I was 23 years old. I was newly trained in the Apache. I was the only woman out of 120 male combat pilots in a regiment. And, uh, And I knew that I was going to be judged differently and looked at differently. And I didn't want to be thought of as trying to be different in any way. So I had my hair cut short, buzzed up the back. I made sure that I maxed every PT test, which is the physical training test. Uh, so there was nothing that could be said. I, I shot top gun, which means had the highest gunnery score for my, um, for my second platoon. And yet over the time that I was in the military, I found myself compromising on things that were important to me and important to who I was. And I think that at the end of the day, if I were to give you a quick answer, which I can't give, really, it's not a quick answer at all, about why I decided not to stay in the military, it's because I'd made too many of those compromises. I tried too hard to fit in to a culture that seemed to demand something other than who I was. And I will own that as my own failure. I think there are other women leaders who are, are better able to, to balance those things. And I think for those leaders that that sustained their time and were able to be promoted to general officer, and that was their goal, and that was something that was a good fit for them. I love the story that Dee McWilliams tells, and she was a um, she was is a retired brigadier general. She most recently was the president of the Women in Military Service to America Memorial, and she is uh, is just herself the whole way through. She's willing to throw things back. She's willing to tell it like it is, and and I think that's a very hard thing to do. But the way that you can do that, as a young person, and again, this is a book that I wish that I had had when I was starting out. It's a book that I wish that I had had as I was navigating any number of challenges, both in and out of uniform, also in the corporate world as well later on in my career. Starting with your own story and investing in yourself enough to really go back and say, these are the things that matter to me. I'm not going to compromise on these. And I won't be able to sustain my contributions if I do compromise on these. So understanding that early on, I think, sets you up for success. And I share some of these lessons from my own story and and others do as well from where I failed. And this is one of the areas where I failed. It's a, a very challenging thing, I think, for a number of leaders. Well, that's very kind of you to share that um, and to be that authentic with us on this call. We're coming toward the end of our time here, and we've spoken about four of the eight aspects of grit. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about all of them. But I do want you to talk a little bit about the last of the eight aspects and why, above all, be adaptable. Yeah, well, I mean, this time is is maybe the best example of why it is that we need to be adaptable, because there are certainly a lot of things that can get in your way along any given journey. And, you know, it's one of the stories that I often will relay about owning my own story has everything to do also with being adaptable, which is, you know, very early on, I was still a cadet in ROTC. I was still uh, just a, just a student. I hadn't yet graduated and I had been drilling as part of the national guard with their simultaneous membership program in the North Carolina national guard. So it's towards the end of my senior year, And I drive out to Raleigh, North Carolina to receive my assignment for the years ahead. I stand at attention to in front of this huge desk with the colonel behind it, the state aviation officer. And I salute and he asked me to sit down and we exchange a couple of words back and forth before he stops in the middle of a sentence and leans back in his chair and looks down his nose and says, you realize, cadet, that you will never fly an attack aircraft. And I look back at him And I recognize his comment for what it's meant to be, which is small and mean and cutting, because in 1993, attack aircraft weren't open to women to fly. But I also understood that there was a serious obstacle in my way, that I was not going to be able to move along the path that I had been uh, given, that had been suggested to me. And I went back to the detachment on the campus of Duke University for ROTC and requested a transfer out of the National Guard and onto active duty. It's a small example, but it's an example of where 
there should have been a path that I followed that most people followed. And that path was blocked. And there was no way that I was going to make it through that, that obstacle. And when that happens, and that's happening to a lot of us right now with paths that we thought we may have outlined, with plans that we may have made, every leader in the book that was successful was able to navigate around those obstacles, to find either a way through or a way over or a way around or a way under. And that's adaptability. Adaptability is, is not staying wed too much to one course of action. But being able to keep that end goal in mind, whether it's short term, intermediate term or long term, knowing that there is more than one way to get to any goal and that you've got to be willing to be a little bit creative in your approach. So adaptability right now, especially when we don't know what the horizon holds, what we don't know what's going to happen in the future, uh, is something that is pretty critical right now. It's pretty unnerving for all of us. Uh, and yet it's a critical trait. So. I would say with adaptability, just as I would say with grit, that none of these are sustainable long-term practices. And so they are things, they are tools, they are characteristics that we need to be able to employ, but also find safe haven where we can come back and rest and recharge as well. So that's the one caveat that I would give to any of this. But that adaptability is is a, a critical piece. It's really where grit marries resilience, I think, in a lot of ways. So that, that leads me to this question then. Is developing grit ever done or accomplished? Can we arrive and move on to something else? Or is it something that we're constantly learning? I've never been asked that question. And I really like that question because it's absolutely a lifelong, it's a lifelong pursuit. I think there's ways that we sometimes are able to find grit in one part of our lives, but it's harder for us to make that application to another. You can borrow from one part of your life and bring it into another, but it does take work and it does take some focused time and, and investment. Um, but I like that question a lot because it is something that you want to continue to work on. And I, I like to say that uh, actually I was at West Point a couple of years ago and we were talking about how you train for hard things by doing hard things. And we want all of us to continue to grow, to continue to learn, We've got to continue to challenge ourselves, and by doing that, we will be, we will be becoming more resilient and and more gritty. So those that's the fortunate thing if we continue to move forward and continue to challenge ourselves. I love that. And which part of the military has the mantra "the only easy day was yesterday"? Is that the SEALs? Maybe they they might. I actually haven't heard that one. I, all I know is that I could get more before nine a.m. than anyone else did all day. But I, it's probably changed by now. <laughs> Probably. All right. Well, my final question for you, Shannon, ties into the title. What is the grit factor? The grit factor is that aspect that is part of all of our makeup. It's all it's a characteristic that weaves throughout the person that we are. And that, again, comes back to this idea that it's not this discreet little thing that we put away, but it's something that is woven into the essence of who we are. And it's something that every leader that I interviewed, they may not have started out understanding that, but they certainly ended up understanding that, that it was something that was going to, everything that they did that was worth doing was going to take effort. It was going to require overcoming challenges and that they were going to have to find that place deep inside themselves where they could get themselves through, drawing on any number of these characteristics. So again, part of the whole leader and not this discrete thing that we can think of and, and put away. Love that answer. And I've had so much fun, Shannon, talking to you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I learned a lot from reading your book. I'm looking forward, as I said earlier, to working through some of the exercises. If any of you have been uh, intrigued by our conversation today, you can purchase the book. Uh, it's called The Grit Factor, and it's available through Amazon and other major booksellers. In addition, Shannon has written The Little Book of Grit, with quotes from leaders across the military branches on leadership and grit. Um, they're all guaranteed to inspire and encourage your own journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to the Conference Board's Off the Shelf Book Discussion podcast series or explore the entire catalog of podcast programming by visiting our website at www.conference-board.org slash podcasts. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. This has been Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board.